Bibles, turn to Luke chapter number 6. God sure has been good to us, amen. amen. And that becomes a cliche and something that we say and we move on to the next thing. Uh, we deserve hell. That's really what we've earned. That's what I deserve, that's what you deserve, and yet the Lord has been good to us. And uh, I praise the Lord for that, amen. amen. God's given you a family, hasn't he? God's given you the church, God's amen. put food on your table, he's paid your bills, he's saved your soul. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's been real good, and he continues to be good. And I praise the Lord for, for his goodness to us this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, this morning I won't win any awards for um, fanciest outline. Uh, I, I won't impress anybody with that. I just got a burden on my heart. The Lord wants for me to deliver. The longer I do this, the more that I realize that, you know, Brother, uh, brother Ben probably doesn't care about my fifth R in verse 27, he probably doesn't care, uh, to be honest with you. And I, I understand that. And I'm for having an outline, and uh, it helps keep you in line, right? It helps formulate your thoughts and things like that. Um, but I think preachers are way more impressed with that kind of thing than, than a normal church member, if I can use that, uh, as a Christian. And by the way, I'm not saying that as a derogatory term. Uh, I knew what the preacher was saying, the missionary. He said, well, I didn't, I didn't feel like God was calling me to to just be a Christian. God was going to use him in full-time ministry, and we praise God for putting the calling on people's lives. But, but uh, obviously, he's not saying just being a Christian is some kind of a demeaning, lesser thing. Um, and uh, being a Christian is a great thing. And I've told you all before, there are no such thing as second-class Christians. And, uh, and as long as you're in the will of God, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. You're in first place. Amen? And if you're in Christ, you're in first place, because he's in first place. And uh, so I praise the Lord for, for salvation and for allowing us to be here this morning. Let's begin reading Luke chapter number 6 and, and verse number 17. All right, Luke chapter number 6 and verse number 17. It says, And he came down with them and stood in the plain and the company of his disciples and a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. This scene that we've just read in Luke chapter 6 is not unlike many other passages of Scripture that you'll find throughout the Gospel record. Jesus Christ, the Bible says, went about doing good, uh, performing miracles, right? Healing people, uh, causing the, the lame to walk and the blind to see. Uh, and even to raise the dead. This is not an uncommon scene. And Jesus Christ went about performing these miracles not simply for the sake of alleviating human suffering. Uh, there are ministries today that the entire uh, purpose and the entire reason they exist is simply to, to feed people that are hungry and to clothe people that are naked and, and, to, and to help people who are sick. And with hospitals and all these other things. And I'm perfectly fine with all of that, right? Jesus did all of those things. But He didn't heal people just for the sake of physical healing. The miracle ministry of Christ was one to confirm the message of Christ. The Bible says in this verse that they came to hear Him. Jesus Christ would perform miracles and He would help people and that was a sign to show that the message of Christ was a legitimate message from God. What did Jesus preach? He preached to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And as He went about preaching that gospel message, He would perform these miracles as a sign to show that the message of Christ is the truth of God. Uh, and, and you and I today, we don't need the miracle ministry of Christ in the same way. We're not total cessationists, but we do believe that you and I have the complete revelation of God in the Scriptures, right? And so you and I have the Bible, uh, and that is our source of truth. We do not need miracles today to confirm the Word of God. We know the Word of God is true. The greatest miracle that's ever been uh, uh, done was the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we just talked about last Sunday. And so when Jesus rose from the dead, He confirmed the Word of God. And as the Word of God is given to us, that which is perfect has come, and that which is in part has now been done away. And so we don't need the ministries in the same way that they needed them, but we do know they needed them at this period of time. And God went about... Jesus, being God, went about performing these miracles. And so what I'm interested in this morning is, is verse number 19. Uh, verse number 19 says, And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. 
I'm interested in that word touch today. That the whole multitude sought to touch him. That word touch, it means to come in contact with. That's just the simple definition. But when you and I think about the word touch, the connotation uh, that comes with this idea of touching someone is intimacy. Right? It is closeness. It, the, the idea of touch, it, it, it conveys care and concern. I think about as soon as you and I are born into this world, right? I've, I've had three kids, and, and as, as soon as they were born, uh, the doctors and nurses, they advocate for this, and this period of time, they call it skin to skin, right? Zach, I know Bo was just born. Y'all remember that, right? It's this skin to skin time, and they put that baby up against that mama, and that skin to skin, that touch, it is a period of time in which there is bonding that's taking place, right? And there is affection that is shared, and there is an intimacy and a closeness there. And I'm amazed at the fact in this, in this verse, the Bible tells us that Jesus was willing to touch them. Think, think about who we're talking about. We're talking about the holy God of heaven. We're talking about the one that stepped out onto nothing and spoke the worlds into existence. I mean, we're talking about the God who in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, that powerful, sovereign, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God is willing to allow human, human man to reach out and to touch him. Physical contact, the closeness that we see in this period of time, in these occasions of Scripture. And I, I just want to begin by saying this, and I expect a healthy amen. You and I today, we need the touch of God. Amen. You don't need another message. You don't need the mechanics of another service. You, you, you do not need some, some ritual. No, you need a touch from God. I need a touch from God. I need His hand on my life. I need for Him to help me and to empower me and to heal me and do everything that the touch of God can do. I need all of it. And you do too. And in this passage of Scripture, we see needy people coming to Christ and, and getting a touch from Him. I think our nation needs a touch from God. Don't you? I mean, our world, especially I'll say America, I mean, the old saying is they're going to hell in a handbasket, and that is the truth, that is the reality on the ground. We see a world that has rejected the reality of God. They're trying to take Him out of the schools, take Him uh, out of our culture and out of our society. They want to remove uh, the dictates of the Ten Commandments from our courts of law, trying to erase Him from the justice system. I mean, in every area of our life, in academics, in entertainment, and in the culture, they're trying to remove Christ from everything. They need the touch of God, right? Our homes need the touch of God. Listen, if, you're, if your kids are going to get saved and go to heaven, God's going to have to reach into their life. God's going to have to... If this church is going to have the power of God and we're going to see sinners saved and we're going to see saints encouraged and families built together and people grow up to love God and to serve Him, you're going to need the touch of God. You need more than what I can give. You need more than what any mortal man can give. We need to see the power of God on display. We need the touch of God. And in this verse, I see just a few things quickly about the touch of God uh, related in these verses. First of all, I want to say that they searched for a touch. Verse number 19 says, And the whole multitude sought to touch Him. That word sought, it simply means to seek. They were looking for a touch from Jesus. They were looking for it. You know what you'll find? What you're looking for. I think, a lot, I think one of the biggest problems in our churches today, and by the way, I, I, let me fix that, let me amend, amend that. I'm not preaching to the churches uh, in our area, I'm preaching to this church. One of the biggest problems in our church is apathy. There are people who are completely apathetic and indifferent to the touch of God. Meaning, they could take it or leave it. Right? That's apathy. It just, it just, it's a want of feeling. It is a privation of passion. It's people who really just don't care if God moves in their life. They don't really care if God touches their home and their family and their children. I mean, they're just indifferent to it all. They, they don't have any desire. They're not looking for a touch from heaven. A touch from Jesus Christ will change the status quo. Amen. Whatever's going on in your life, when Jesus, every time we see Jesus touching something, I think it was Miss Natalie Raines wrote the song that everything He touched, He changed. I mean, if you follow the ministry of Christ, when you see the hand of God touch something, it is never the same again. 
I think a lot of people aren't searching for a touch because we're not looking for a change. We're, we're, we're just content with the way things are. We want our home life to be the same. We want our marriage to be the same. We want our church life to be the same. We, just want, we want everything to just continue in the path that it's on. We're not looking for anything supernatural. We're not searching for that. We're searching for status quo and the way that things are. You know why these folks are looking for a touch? Why they're searching for a touch from Jesus? Because they're desperate. There's an urgency in their life. I can imagine these folks who were sick have done everything that they physically could do to be healed. I would. Wouldn't you? These folks who were, who were vexed with unclean spirits, I'm sure they'd have done everything they possibly could to be healed. And they got to a place where they realized that if I'm going to get any help in my life, it's going to have to come from that man, Jesus Christ. And they're searching for Him and they're looking for Him and they're trying to erase the distance between themselves and God so they can get the touch that they desperately need. You'll look for a touch from Jesus Christ when you get desperate and when you realize that you need more than you can give. I remember years ago, and I think I may have told this before back in January, of uh, 2014 when my dad passed away. Y'all remember, I was a member here and, and everything. And, and I remember I, I was asked to preach the funeral. I was tapped to preach the funeral. And I had never preached the funeral before. I'd only been preaching for five months and, and, and trying to, to, to wrestle with that and well, what in the world am I supposed to preach? And I remember God giving me a message. I come up here that morning, January 14, 2014. I remember standing. I was probably down here on the floor right here about where the pulpit used to be. And I remember getting up here about 7 o'clock in the morning that morning and trying to get up and practice preach the message that I was going to preach at my dad's funeral. It was terrible. It went awful. And I just remember the, the, the helplessness and the hopelessness of that situation. I remember laying on my face right here about where this communion table is and begging God and saying, God, I need a touch from you. I need help from heaven. I can't do this on my own. I need for you to reach into my situation and give me strength and give me the ability to do what I can't do. And God did it. Amen. Was able to go to the funeral. God blessed it. Went through it. Preacher Wumper told me beforehand, he said that'll be the easiest message that you'll ever preach. I said, I, I cannot understand that. How in the world could that be? He said, I'm telling you, it'll be the easiest message that you'll ever preach. You know why? Because I was at my weakest. 2 Corinthians 12, right? That's when the power of Christ can rest upon us. Jesus Christ can work through you and I to the extent to, the extent to which we'll allow Him to and we'll admit our weakness. You've got to come to the end of yourself, right? I remember getting up and preaching and afterward people come to me. I had a few people come to me and say, they said, God's hand was on you today. That's exactly what I needed. Amen? I need a touch from God. I needed to be in His hand. I needed for Him to wield me and to use me and to empower me and to give me the words to say and give me a touch from heaven. That's what I needed. And I was looking for it. And thank God I found it because I, got, I started looking for it. I was searching for a touch. One of the dumbest statements I think I've ever heard. Kids, if you're not allowed to say dumb, then don't say that. But, but it was, it's dumb. It is that God helps those who help themselves. You ever heard that? God helps those that help themselves. That is so stupid. That is not true at all. That is not true. God helps those that realize they cannot help themselves and trust Jesus Christ for help. Amen. Amen. That's who God helps. God helps those who will look for Him to help them. They were searching for a touch. Secondly, I want to say they sacrificed for a touch. Look in verse number 17. Verse 17 says, And He came down with them and stood in the plain, and the company of His disciples and a great multitude of the people out of all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coasts of Tyre and Sidon. I'm interested in the two places from which these people came. One group, it says they came from Tyre and Sidon. That, that was a Gentile area, Gentile nation. They're, they're two cities. They're close together. You almost always see anytime Tyre is mentioned, Sidon will be mentioned with it because they're close to each other. They're, they're Mediterranean coastal cities, and, and they're always mentioned together. But this was not a part of, of, of Jerusalem. This wasn't a part of Judea. That They were their own thing over here on the side. And this was a secular, Gentile, pagan place. 
In fact, Jesus says this in Luke chapter number 10, verse number 13. He says, Woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which had been done in you, they would have repented while ago, or they, uh, for they a great while ago repented, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Essentially saying this, Tyre and Sidon was a disadvantaged place. It was a sinful place. It was a wicked place. And what we see in this passage of Scripture is people who are willing to put a sinful place in their rearview mirror. They're willing to walk away from what they're used to. They're willing to walk away from the sin that surrounded them and get to a place where Jesus can touch them. Some of you, if you're going to get a touch from heaven, you're going to have to sacrifice some things. There's going to be some sin in your life that you're going to have to turn away from, that you're going to have to leave behind you. Some compromise. My goodness, we're good at compromises, aren't we? We're, we're chief negotiators when, when it comes to, to, get to doing what we want to do. And we'll rationalize our sin and we'll justify our sin. Well, I know, it's, it's, I know, you know God, Jesus wouldn't do it, but, you know, and, and come up with these little excuses. An excuse is not a reason, by the way. Amen. An excuse is not a reason. And we'll make these excuses for our sin. Listen, as long as we're doing that, we're we're, going to stay distant from God. Again, the word touch, it means to come in contact with. They couldn't come in contact with Him in Tyre and Sidon because He wasn't there. Right? Jesus is out in these plains. They they had to leave where they were and get to where He was. They had to erase the distance between themselves and God to get a touch from Him. A lot of people won't get the touch from God that they need in their home, in their family because there's too much to sacrifice. There's too much to leave behind. I enjoy my life of sin. I enjoy what I've got going. I enjoy this illicit relationship that, that, that's leading me away from God. I enjoy my drinking. Right? I enjoy my lust. I enjoy my immorality. You fill in the blank. Listen, when I got saved and I, when, I, when, when I started serving God, when I really started serving Him at 16 years old, listen, there were some places that I used to go that I, I didn't want to go anymore. Amen. Amen. There are some things that I used to say that I couldn't say anymore. Some things I used to listen to that I couldn't listen to anymore. There were some people that I used to hang around that they didn't want to hang around me anymore. I had to put Tyre and Sidon behind me. Y'all get the picture? I, I, had, I had to say, I'm willing to sacrifice popularity. I'm willing to sacrifice the things of this world for the things of that world. And if you're not willing to do that, you, you, you're going to stay distant and you won't be able to come in contact with the one who can heal your problems. Amen. Some of you are living in Tyre and Sidon and you're unwilling to forsake what you need to forsake to get where you need to be so God can touch your life. Some people are going to have to forsake family, sacrifice family, right? Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verse number 22, Jesus told that that rich uh, ruler, he says, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. There's an invitation from Christ. Say, are you willing to sacrifice wealth to have a touch from Jesus Christ and to be close to Him? You know, the Bible says that the world passeth away. The Bible says this world is going to melt with a fervent heat. That house that I live in, it is not going to stand there forever. Amen? 163 Chapman Road, that house is not, it ain't going to be there long. That there's going to come a day where that house is going to be gone. The car I drive, the clothes you wear, the things that consume our lives, that we're unwilling to sacrifice for God, one of these days, all of those things will be gone and they'll be just God. And if you'll sacrifice the things of this world for the things of that world on that day, you'll be glad that you are willing to forsake Tyre and Sidon and follow Christ. So many to leave behind sin. So many to leave behind self righteousness. Look in verse number sixteen, or excuse me, verse seventeen. It says, "And a great multitude of people out of all Judea and Jerusalem." 
You got these Gentiles coming from Tyre and Sidon, they're forsaking a place of sin. And then you've got these Jews who are leaving behind Jerusalem. They're leaving, you know what Jerusalem's known for? The temple. It's known for the Pharisees. It's known for the religious system. And, and they were, they were going to have to leave that behind to get close to Jesus. You know why a lot of people, and listen, and, I, and I'm, I'm not trying to be rude, there are some churches who, who basically they're going to come in and they're going to sit down and they're going to twiddle their thumbs, they're going to stare at the wall, they're going to sing, uh, you know, um, they're going to sing hymns, uh, they'll, they'll sing the songs that we just sang, Near My God to Thee, or, or whatever it was we just sang, whatever, uh, Near, Still Near, I don't know what it is. What, what, what are we saying? At the, near the cross, that's right, near the cross. They'll sing near the cross and it might as well have been a Latin liturgy. I mean, it's just cold and dead and dry. I mean, it's just some religious practice that means absolutely nothing to them. You say, why is that? Because they know if Jesus Christ shows up, and if Jesus Christ reaches into that church, and if He touches that place, they'll lose their program. They'll lose their religious system and, and the structure that they've built. That they're, they're so righteous. They have so much self-righteousness that they don't need Christ's righteousness. When I got saved, I had to forsake my self-righteousness and my sin. Amen? I had to repent of both of those things. I had to realize that I'm not good enough and I need Jesus Christ to touch me and to save my soul and I had to repent of my sin. But if you're not willing to leave both of those things behind, you're not going to get a touch from heaven. Amen. Self-righteousness. They said, I, I, you know, I, and, and when you think back to Jerusalem, the place they're leaving behind, it ain't going to be long. They're going to put Jesus Christ on a cross. They're going to kill the Lord Jesus Christ and crucify Him. Why? Because He showed up there in the temple and what did He do? He starts overthrowing the money changers and the seats of them that sell doves, right? He starts preaching to them. He's upsetting their religious system. They charge Him with blasphemy because He's claimed to be the Son of God, which He is, knowing that that made Him equal with God. I mean, He didn't fit into their religious structure. And because of that, they rejected Him. Listen, I, I would rather have Jesus and the touch of God than I would a program, than I would remaining dignified. That's pride. That's all that is. Amen. That's pride. So, well, you know, we got we to gotta gotta do things decent and in order. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. The Bible talks about that. But, but your order programs God out of the church. That's Laodicea where Jesus is on the outside and He's knocking trying to get in because we've programmed Him out of this place. We're not going to do that here. By the grace of God, we're not going to do that here. But, but you can do that in your personal life. We'll say, we say, well, God, I'll praise you, but I won't do that. The moment that you set up any reservations or any hesitation, you've programmed God out of your life. And you've distanced yourself from Him. Because you're saying, I do not want a touch from heaven. Does this make sense? You're going to have to leave behind Jerusalem. They searched, they sacrificed. Thirdly, they were saved by his touch. Look at verse 17, last part of verse 17. It says, which came to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. They came in contact with Christ, and they were healed of their afflictions. This crowd was afflicted with diseases. It says to be healed of their diseases. Now sickness is something that is natural to our world after the fall, right? There was no sickness in the world that God created. He created everything says it's very good. Sickness is a result of sin. Disease is a result of sin. So that's the natural world that you and I live in. But when you follow Christ throughout His earthly ministry, we see time and time again that He is not bound to the natural world. He's God. Amen. He's supernatural. He's above that which is natural. And He can reach into that which is natural. And He, with His supernatural power, can save us from sickness and disease. You follow Christ throughout His life. Now, all the miracles of Christ, that's what they all speak to. The fact that Jesus Christ is supreme over the natural world. You know, there, are, there are people out there who have a problem with the miracles of Christ. They have a problem with this passage. One group would be deists. Anybody know what a deist is? Somebody believes in, they believe in God. They believe that God created the world and created human beings, but they reject anything miraculous. George Washington was a deist. 
Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Benjamin Franklin was a deist. Thomas Paine was a deist. They said, well, we do believe in God. We believe God created things. But they, but they tripped over the supernatural things. They tripped over the miracles of Christ. Here, here's, my, here's my reasoning. This is, I'm from Calpin, so this is going to be you know, a little difficult. But th- here's the way I think about it. If Genesis 1-1 is true, there is nothing incredible or unbelievable about the miracles of Christ. Amen? If, if in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth... Parting the Red Sea is no problem. Causing the sun to stand still, that's not hard at all. Feeding 5,000 with, with, with five loaves and two fishes, that's not an issue. If, if God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, the rest of it's easy to believe. I don't have any problem with the miracles of Christ. And we see these miracles of Christ over and over again where Jesus Christ heals those who are sick. Luke chapter 5, you're in Luke 6, Luke 5, 13, says, And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. Jesus heals a leper with his touch in Luke chapter 5. Now, touching a leper by the rules of the day is not what you're supposed to do. Leprosy is notoriously contagious. Uh, You you don't want to touch leprosy because it's going to get on you. Well, listen, when, we don't have to worry about that with Jesus Christ. Amen? When Jesus touches a leper, the leper catches what Jesus has. Jesus don't catch what the leper has. Right? And so that leper, leper is healed immediately by the touch of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 22, Peter cuts a man's ear off who came to take Jesus. The Bible says, And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far? And he touched his ear and healed him. Matthew chapter 9, two blind men are following Jesus and they're begging for mercy. The Bible says, Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open. Look in chapter 7. Take your Bible. You're in Luke chapter 6. Look in Luke chapter 7. I want you to see this. Luke chapter 7 and verse number 12. We're talking about the touch of Christ being more powerful than the natural world. All right. Look in verse number 12, Luke chapter 7. It says, Now when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier. That word, it it, it means a casket, right? This is a coffin. This man's being carried dead in a coffin. The Bible says, Jesus says, Weep not, and he touches that Casket. It says, And they that bare him stood still, and he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. The touch of Jesus Christ has power over death. Not sure why the disciples had a problem believing the resurrection of Jesus Christ because Jesus had already proven to them time and time again that he had power over death. He heals this dead man with simply a touch. That's a powerful God. Amen? His power over death. These folks were afflicted with diseases. Secondly, they were afflicted with devils. Verse 18 says, back back in Luke chapter number 6, verse 18 says, And they that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they that were healed. Christ's touch has power over the spiritual world. He's the one, the Bible says in James chapter 2, that the devils believe and tremble. He's the one the Bible talks about in Matthew chapter number 8 where those devils cried out and said, What have thee to do with thee, or what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Art thou come to torment us before the time? E- each person who was possessed with a devil or spirit had spiritual needs in their life, Jesus Christ, his touch had power over the spiritual world. Amen. You may be here today and you have a spiritual problem. If you're lost, you have a spiritual problem. Right? You were dead in your trespasses and sins. And I was too. Everybody here at one point has been dead in their trespasses and sins. March 11, 2004, Jesus Christ reached into my life. He touched me. He saved my soul. And He cured me of my spiritual problem. And He'll do the same thing for you. Amen. Amen? If you'll trust Him, listen, Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins that sin that separates you from God, that sin that's sending you to hell. Jesus Christ died for that sin. He was buried. He rose again the third day. And now if you'll trust Jesus Christ for salvation, He will forgive you. And you'll have heaven as your home. You can skip hell and be saved today.
by trusting Him because He has power over spiritual problems. There's somebody here today who may be depressed. They may have some anxiety or some fear that's captivated their life and that is controlling them. That is a spiritual problem from which Jesus Christ has power over. Say, what do I need? You need a touch from God. You need to get close enough to Him. Amen? James chapter 4 verse number 8 says, To draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. I've had times in my life where I felt like there was distance between me and the Lord. And I've taken just a, I mean, just a baby step. Just the slightest look in His direction. And He's coming to you. Amen? I mean, it, listen, it may not be the biggest thing. It may not be grand. It may not be everything that it should be. But if it's directed toward Christ, if it's a step toward Him, if it's moving in His direction, He'll be moving in your direction. And you can get that touch from God that you need. Lastly, they were strengthened by His touch. Look in verse number 9. Verse number 9, or excuse me, verse number 19. I'm sorry. Luke chapter 6, verse number 19. It says, And the whole multitude sought to touch Him. Why? For there went out, for there went virtue out of Him and healed them all. That word virtue, the way that we use it today, it would mean a, a moral excellence. All right? It, it means goodness and righteousness. But when our Bible was translated back 1611, that word, that word for virtue, it meant strength. Strength. When he says that there went out virtue out of him and healed them all, saying there was a strength that came from the touch of Christ. When Jesus Christ touched them, he imparted strength to them. There, there are many people, I believe sadly, who, Christians, who are weak spiritually because they're not close enough to Jesus. This is not deep theology, guys. Are you with me? This is not deep. This is not hard to understand. If you're, if you're living for this world, if you're separated from God, if fellowship has been broken between you and God, you're not going to be able to live in that strength. You've separated yourself from that, right? Once you're saved, you are always saved. But you can hinder fellowship. Amen? Go read 1 John. You can hinder that fellowship. Listen, we need the strength of God. This church does. My home does. Your, your family you need the strength of God to make it through the things that we have to go through in this life. Heartbreaks and disappointment, struggling with our own flesh. So what do I need? You need the strength of God. You need for God to touch you, to touch your life, to help you to have the strength that you need to make it through this life. Miss Alicia, if you'll move towards the piano, if you'd like to play, play Draw Me Nearer. Is that all right? If it's in that book. If not, play something else. Play Draw Me Nearer. I want to spend some time praying today. Let's ask for God to touch us, all right? Let's all stand.